This is Robert Kaplan from the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. This is a podcast series about great power rivalry in an age of global demons. If Russia continues to interfere with our democracy, I'm prepared to take further actions to respond. Cyber attacks on the United States, economic coercion. The United States does not have the qualification to say that it wants to speak to China from a position of strength. How will conflicts between the United States and China and between the United States and Russia interact with pandemics, climate change, massive cyber attacks, state failures, and other terrors of a global media age? You'll want to listen closely to the breaks because you might be one of the lucky listeners to receive my latest book, The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Gersoni, the U.S. government's greatest humanitarian, as part of a giveaway. With me today for another edition of the podcast series, I have with me Robert Work, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, arguably Washington's greatest intellectual on all high-tech warfare. He's a very unusual person because he combines bureaucratic expertise with intellectual expertise. Bob also served in the Marine Corps, so he brings a lot of expertise. Bob, welcome. Uh, It's great to be here, Robert, and thank you for those overly kind words. Define the China threat. How is it militarily unique compared to the Soviet Cold War threat? What should Americans know about the China threat that's just different and unique? China is a full spectrum peer in military operations. And by that, I mean they can hang with the United States technologically across the board in microelectronics, in guided munitions, in stealth, in missilery they are quite a formidable military power. What makes them different than the Soviet Union is the Soviet Union was able to compete with the United States in niche areas like space capabilities, nuclear capabilities. They were quite good in undersea capabilities. But in terms of their broad technological capacity, they simply weren't in the same league as the United States. In fact, the United States created a competitive strategy to exploit that deficiency. We call it now the second offset strategy. And it was designed to say, look, we are going to pursue these high technology information-based weapons and systems that we know the Soviet Union will not be able to compete with us in over time. We can't make that kind of judgment with China. So they are quite formidable across the board. You've been involved, I think, with the third offset strategy. Could you define what, you know, explain what offset strategies are and why this is called the third and what does it do? Essentially, since World War II, the United States does not try to match a military competitor, soldier for soldier, plane for plane, ship for ship, or tank for tank. It tries to exploit technology to give it an advantage should war break out. So the first two offset strategies simply were trying to offset the numerical advantage that the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact enjoyed in the Central European theater. And the United States was going to use technology to try to offset the advantage. The third offset strategy was different in that it said, now we have are facing a military peer that is as good as we are. How do we offset their ability to fight the same type of war that we would fight? How would we change the way we operate? So the third offset strategy was trying to think that problem through. And have we thought it through? I mean, is there a basic definition of the third offset that's not classified that can be spoken about? No, I think the easiest way to think about it is in this new era of high-tech warfare, It really is what the Chinese refer to as a systems confrontation. It's the collision of these big digital battle networks that can look deep, can shoot deep, and kill deep using guided munitions. And 
we never had to face an opponent like that before. After the end of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union imploded, they were the only competitor that really could have tried to hang with us in this type of warfare. But they imploded. They went away. So the United States enjoyed an enormous military advantage for 20, 25 years. But by that time, the Chinese and to a great degree, the Russians have caught up. Now what we have to do is say, well, how will we fight against a competitor that is as good in this way of warfare as we are? So the third offset strategy said we have to start thinking about system on system warfare rather than what is called combined arms warfare, like Blitzkrieg. What would war with China over Taiwan or in the South China Sea actually be like? In other words, palpable descriptive sense. Would it be a short, sharp war? Could it go on for many weeks? Would it entail autonomous systems and and cyber attacks? You know, because when people imagine a war in the South China Sea, you know, people say, oh, like World War II in the Pacific, like the Battle of the Philippine Sea or something. But obviously it would be much different. This would be a great power war against nuclear armed opponents, both of them highly technically capable. Chinese strategic culture seeks to try to win the war before it goes kinetic. So I would expect a war with China to begin first in space because the United States would need space-based capabilities to bring its networks across the Pacific. And it would most likely involve a major cyber attack on the continental United States. Uh, Leaders of China, I think, would try to get the U.S. to capitulate or not start the fight without really getting to a major war. If it did get to a major war, the Chinese refer to this as a local war under high technology conditions. They would like to geographically constrain it. Neither side most likely will do that. More likely that if we get into a war with China, it would spread across the globe in different ways. You wouldn't be seeing big giant battles in the Indian Ocean or in the Mediterranean. But you would be seeing all sorts of military, economic, and coercive activities going on across the globe. It would be extremely deadly. The type of weapons that both sides would use generally always hit their targets. And that's the big difference now, Robert. In unguided weapons warfare, most of the shots we took miss their targets. And greater the range, the greater the miss distance. So that meant that you had to fire enormous salvos to ensure that you would get a hit on the target you were aiming at. Guided munitions essentially will hit their target regardless of range. It is accuracy independent of range. And so instead of having to drop enough bombs or shoot enough weapons to ensure a target hit, you only have to shoot enough weapons to saturate the defense. Because if one weapon leaks through, it is most likely going to hit the target. So it is extraordinarily deadly. This is going to be the same in the air, on the sea, under the sea, in land, on the land. And the United States simply hasn't fought against a competitor with this type of capability. It's almost as if, the way you describe it, that the revolution in precision-guided weaponry is sort of the equivalent of or the inverse of nuclear weapons, because that was the bigger, the better, irregardless of accuracy, while this is very minutely accurate. The second offset was all using these guided munitions. This is how we were going to offset the Warsaw Pact's numerical superiority. So we did a demonstration. It was called Assault Breaker. And we demonstrated how we could put a radar in an airplane flying high that could look deep behind the forward line of troops, the, you know, the defensive line of NATO. We could see where the Warsaw Pact was marshalling their forces. We could fire these guided munitions at them and destroy them before they even got to the forward line of troops. Now, this happened in 1982. In 1984, the Soviet general staff said, this is a revolution, what they called a military technical revolution, because the United States will be able to achieve the same battlefield effects that they were planning on if they had used tactical nuclear weapons, but they were going to use conventional weapons. And it completely flummoxed the Soviet Union, completely overthrew their campaign model. 
And when we come back, we'll discuss what a pacing threat is and how it relates to intelligent warfare. This podcast is sponsored by the Foreign Policy Research Institute, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. Founded in 1955, FPRI is committed to producing the highest quality scholarship and expert analysis through the lens of history, geography, and culture. For more information about FPRI and our work to educate the public on the most pressing foreign policy issues of the day, please visit www.fpri.org. For years, I have heard people in the Pentagon talking about China as the pacing threat. This goes back beyond Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin's use of the word publicly. How do we keep pace and what do we concentrate on? That is the question of the day. Pacing threat means that the competitor has capabilities that really stress the joint force. And if we went to war, they would have capabilities that would really cause us problems. So they are the threats that we have to constantly think about. How do we overcome these threats? What do we have to do to change the way we operate, to change the way our tactics, to change our procedures, to develop new technologies so that we can overcome these threats? The Chinese are great missileers. They have all sorts of different missiles. So how do we keep pace with them? They are leading right now in hypersonic weapons, for example. We're a little behind them. How do we catch up? What do we need to do to get ahead? And what the Chinese have decided is the way they believe they can leapfrog the U.S. military as the greatest military in the world is to pursue what they call intelligentized warfare, which at its core has artificial intelligence at its core with big data, cloud computing, the Internet of Things. And they believe that if they can really wage intelligentized warfare better than the joint force, then they will leapfrog the United States as the number one military power in the world. And they want to do that by 2030. That is their stated goal. In dealing with the pacing threat, doesn't this get very difficult in terms of Pentagon budgets and priorities? Because it may mean, say, giving more money to the Navy and less money to the Army or fixing the procurement process. Isn't this a bureaucratic challenge as as an intellectual military challenge? It sure as heck is. You know, the United States is coming out of the Budget Control Act and sequestration years, which really hurt readiness across the force. And the force is really focused on restoring combat readiness, multi-domain combat readiness, in the air, on the sea, under the sea, in cyberspace, in space, etc. And right now, money is relatively tight. We've got a lot of money in an absolute sense, but there are so many priorities. So, for example, in the 2020s, we need to recapitalize our nuclear deterrent force. That's extraordinarily expensive. And so it just takes away money that would otherwise be used to buy new conventional capabilities like stealth bombers or long-range missiles or new capabilities. And all of the services are competing for this limited pot of money. It really is getting intense. I think you heard Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, several months ago said, hey, it's going to be a bloodbath. You know, the the Army and the Air Force are going to have to give up money to the Navy. But you were right. This is a bureaucratic challenge because we have to set our own priorities and we have to ruthlessly pursue them. And the United States military used to really be a formidable long-term strategic competitor. I mean, we won the Cold War, but we've lost a lot of those muscles. And so the Pentagon is relearning how to approach a long-term strategic competition. And I think they're getting better, but you're right. This is a bureaucratic challenge as much as anything else. How does China intend to take Taiwan? We know they're committed to it. 
I assume they especially want this to happen before the 100th anniversary of China in 2049. But I'm sure that they don't want to have to fight for it because in a major war, because then there's a chance they could always lose. And if they lose, that could endanger the survivability of the Communist Party and you know the Chinese economy, et cetera. So do you think they have some plan like we'll envelop Taiwan, we'll make an end run around Taiwanese sovereignty, information attacks, and things like that? That will be their preference, I believe, Robert. You know, an information blockade, cut undersea cables that connect Taiwan to the global economy, perhaps have a blockade of seagoing trade so that nothing can get to Taiwan, to threaten them with missile attack, to do all sorts of special operations and fifth column type operations on Taiwan, and try to get the government to capitulate before the United States could intervene if they decided to intervene. China has come up so fast that we seem really to be in a bipolar world again with an asterisk, and the asterisk is Russia, kind of. But it's bipolar world, and bipolar world, historians tell us, are stable. They're less stable than a unipolar world, but they're certainly more stable than a multipolar world. So that all this we're planning on that we've been talking about hopefully will not happen in terms of an actual war with Taiwan, because I like the term Cold War, because it means both sides don't want it to become hot. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think both countries want to avoid a full up great power war. And I like the way Kevin Rudd, former prime minister of Australia, says this is going to be all about managed strategic competition, where both sides really push, they probe, look for advantage. They compete, compete, compete across the realm. But hopefully, before things become too heated and you start to think about using the military instrument, both sides will start to talk to each other and say, how do we de-escalate here? You've mentioned Taiwan, the South China Sea. I agree with you, by the way, that we are in a, a bipolar world. I think we are. There's a Norwegian defense analyst by the name of Oysten Tungsha. And he writes a very interesting book. And he says, look, this is exactly what Hans Morgenthau argued after World War II, that the Soviet Union, the United States had separated themselves so much from the rest of the world that for all intents and purposes, it was a bipolar world. And he also goes on to say that the competition naturally tended to go to other areas in proxy wars and things like that, because the risks of a nuclear confrontation were just too high for both sides. Now, in this world, where most of the competitors are separated by water, he judges that the chances of a military miscalculation are much higher. And the miscalculation could occur in the East China Sea with Japan. It could occur over Taiwan. It occur in the South China Sea. So this is, as I said, we've got to get, I hate to use the term whole of government because it's used all the time. But we really have to get our whole of government strategic muscles working again, where the whole government is saying, how do we approach this strategic competition in a way where war is avoided? And when we come back, we'll discuss how to actually prepare for a war without having to fight it. If you're enjoying the Global Demons podcast, You'll also enjoy Robert D. Kaplan's latest book, The Good American, a sweeping yet intimate story of the most influential humanitarian you've never heard of, Bob Grissoni, who spent four decades in crisis zones around the world. Thanks to our sponsor, Random House, you can win a signed copy of The Good American just by listening to this podcast. All you have to do is subscribe to this podcast and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. We will have a random drawing and announce the winner on our 13th and final episode. Getting specific here, in the Trump administration, there was a lot of talk of a 355-ship Navy. What is so special about the number 355? 
And isn't the kind and quality of ships more important than sheer numbers? In other words, my question is, what should be the optimal size of our Navy and how do we get there? Well, first of all, 355 is just one number among many. There have been several assessments over the last three or four years, and the numbers range from 355 to 450, and sometimes they include unmanned ships and sometimes they don't. It really is the capability of the Navy. Now, there are two basic schools of thought here, Robert. One is that you size the Navy for a war. So you do war plans and you do war games to test the war plans. And you say, okay, after running the war game, it looks like a Navy of, let's just, I'm just going to make up a number, of 350 ships with carriers and this many submarines and this many, you know, whatever, covers the kind of gamut of the things that might pop up in a war. So you size the Navy for a war. Then there are those that say, look, the role of the Navy really is to prevent war. And the way to prevent war is to have forward presence, which means more ships out and about, demonstrating U.S. resolve, reassuring U.S. allies, and deterring would-be adversaries. And the rule of thumb generally, it doesn't work out perfectly, but generally you need four ships to keep one forward because you have one forward, for example, then you have one ship going out, you have one ship coming back that's been replaced, and you have one ship that's in maintenance. So you actually need to have more ships for a forward presence Navy than you do for the war fight. And the number just depends on, okay, where do we want to have ships? But for me, the best way you prevent a war is to be prepared to win it if it starts. So I'm very much in the war fighting fleet school. And, you know, the numbers, you know, do you have more submarines or do you have more surface ships? You know, how many aircraft carriers do you have? The U.S. Navy is still absolutely the number one Navy in the world. And the margin between the U.S. Navy and the next competitor, a lot of people call it the People's Liberation Army Navy plan, is not that close. But what the plan does is to operate underneath land-based air power, air cover, land-based missiles, land-based intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance networks. And when they're operating underneath that, man, that is a tough, tough fight. But if the Chinese Navy goes out into the open, into the Pacific, the U.S. Navy would turn them into fish food in not very much time. So yes, the Chinese Navy is a formidable Navy, but it is because it operates underneath the cover of a continental-based and the term of the art is anti-access area denial system. All right, switching from the Navy to the role of the Marine Corps. When the new Marine Commandant took over, there were quite a number of stories about how he was reorienting the Marine Corps back to its tradition as a naval force and away from the land fighting that it actually did in Iraq and Afghanistan to make it really an adjunct for our competition with China. Do you agree with this strategy? Is it putting too much in one basket? You know, could it have been diversified? Is it diversified? Talk a little bit about Marine Corps strategy here. Well, first of all, I really admire what the Commandant of the Marine Corps has done. I mean, for a service chief to say, look, Marine Corps, we are not organized, structured to win a fight if a war goes down in the Western Pacific. So we're going to change ourselves. For a service chief to do that is quite remarkable. And so what the commandant has done, I think, is really, really admirable. And what are you saying? Our new strategy, uh, Robert, says that we're going to have what is called the contact forces, which are out and about all the time doing competition missions you know, trying to keep crises from escalating, meeting Chinese, Russian, Iranian, North Korean activities in what are called the gray zone. So we're going to have this contact force, and it's going to be the one that's closest to the potential fight. Then there's a blunt force. And if the contact force is unable to keep a crisis from escalating, and we start to go into war, the blunt force is supposed to try to keep an adversary from achieving their objectives. 
And then there's a surge force, you know, all of the forces there in the United States will surge into the Pacific. And the Commandant said, we're going to be a contact force. And it's not like the entire Marine Corps is changing. He has what are called three Marine Literal Regiments, MLRs. And these are three regiments that he is going to organize, train, and equip to operate along the first island chain, perhaps in Philippines if we have basing there, perhaps on Japanese islands in the lower Ryukus. And they would have surface-to-surface anti-ship missiles, and they would have surface-to-air missiles. And they would operate in conjunction with the fleet to bottle up the Chinese Navy and to practice what is called sea denial, you know, kind of make no-go areas for the Chinese fleet to move. And he's doing it by breaking apart these large formations that would be seen by Chinese intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR networks, and be targeted by guided munitions. He's breaking them into small 50 to 75 person units that have missiles, and they're on trucks, so they can move really, really fast. What he's trying to do is create a dilemma for Chinese planners and operate inside what he refers to as the beaten zone, the zone that is targeted by missiles. And again, he's only converting three regiments. I think if you're a Chinese planner and you say, okay, how do we we kind of sweep away these very small units that have surface-to-surface anti-ship missiles? How do we sweep them away? How do we give more freedom of maneuver for our fleet? It's not a trivial problem. So I think it's really good that the Marine Corps and the Navy are really talking more integrated combat operations. And the Marines are going to have a lot of unmanned systems and loitering weapons and all sorts of things to complicate Chinese planning. It's all being tested. It's being experimented with. It's being tested. The commandant has said, okay, this isn't going to work. I'm going to have to change my plans. Well, first of all, I think it's the right diagnosis, and we'll see whether or not his plans come to fruition. Bob Work, I just want to thank you so much for your time. This has been extraordinarily insightful. Best of luck, and thank you again so much. Well, thank you for having me. We all need to put on our thinking caps. We're in a long-term strategic competition with a nuclear-armed great power. But as we've talked about, the Chinese are a much different competitor than the Soviet Union was. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Global Demons podcast, brought to you by the Foreign Policy Research Institute. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts and visit our website at www.fpri.org. For the Foreign Policy Research Institute, I'm Robert D. Kaplan.